Up next, Gordon and I review the Lumix LX10 slash LX15 on Camera Labs. Hi, it's Doug Kay, and I'm here with Mr. Camera Labs himself, Gordon Lang. Hello, Gordon. Hello, Doug. How are you? I'm doing very well. Uh, I hope you're doing fairly well. I know you're a bit under the weather today. We won't use that as an excuse. How about that? If I make any mistakes, it's because I'm not feeling that well today, but we don't want to dwell on that. I'll be all right. I'm going to throw all my energy into this, and then I'll go straight to bed afterwards. No, no excuses. Okay, so Lumix has come out with the LX10, as it's known here in North America, and the LX15, as it's known almost everywhere else, uh, a compact camera that uh, pretty much replaces, I think, the LX7 and maybe some others. So give us a, a quick rundown on this nice little compact camera. Okay, this is the Lumix LX10, as it's known in North America, or LX15, as it's known everywhere else. Throughout the show, Doug and I will probably refer to it as one or other or both. So please forgive us, it's the same camera, the LX10 and the LX15. It just depends where you buy it. It actually occupies a, a kind of new position in the Lumix range from Panasonic. It is a premium compact, though, which uh, in the old days meant that it had... A lot of manual control it supports raw files you know lots of dials and things like that but increasingly these days a camera that is described as a premium compact is one that is also based around the sony one inch sensor this is a 20 megapixel sensor that sony made popular with the rx100 series and now there are so many one inch compacts out there and in this show we're going to be discussing some of the other options that are out there as well the reason a one inch compact is interesting is because the sensor size has got roughly four times the surface area of the sensor in most smartphones or in old style point and shoots or in those pocket travel zoom cameras. Now it's nowhere near as big as an APS-C sensor or even a micro four third sensor. It kind of sits roughly in between. But importantly, by having a larger area than a smartphone, it's gonna deliver better performance, especially in low light. And it's gonna have a greater tonal dynamic range. I mean, the bottom line is the picture quality from a one inch compact is going to be or should be better than your phone. And that's the whole point now because phones have become so good, the cameras in them, that they've kind of killed the basic compact market. So the compact market has had to regroup into two categories. One is packing in a massive zoom, like a 30 or even a 40 time zoom in a small package. And the other direction is to put a bigger sensor for better quality. So that's where the LX10, LX15 is. So Doug, if you wanted to buy a one inch camera, a, a rather a premium compact with a one inch sensor, how much would one of these set you back? Uh, here in the US, that would cost me approximately $698 for the LX10. I saw the LX15 since the, the LX10, right? I got to get it straight. LX10 here in North America, right? $698. And that's roughly the price of many of the competitors. Sony's a little higher. We'll talk about that later, perhaps. Uh, but um, that's generally what you're going to pay, seven to $800 more or less so they're not cheap they're, i mean they're not cheap cameras you could buy virtually any phone sim free uh for less than that couldn't you it, it, let me let me give you my perspective on this class of camera because i own i own the sony rx100 mark ii the three and now i have the four um i used to have power shots kind of power shots to me, this is what I call the 24 to 70 in my pocket. I've used that phrase before. It's not my number one camera. It's the it's my number two camera when I travel. Uh, it means that literally when I don't want to have anything in my hands and I don't want a bag, I want to stick something in my pocket and have the equivalent of a 24 to 70. I've, I've had award-winning pictures shot with these little cameras, so don't shy away from them. Um, the only issue is, as you said, even in, in lower light, even... You know, even these cameras, this, the pixels are small. Um, so in low light, you're going to lose some stuff. But I just switched to monochrome. And then we don't call it noise. We call it grain. <laughs> That's, I like that. I like that. It's yeah. very good. So anyway, this, this as you said, the, the low-end compacts, the point-and-shoots are sort of gone. But this premium compact world is still very much alive. Yeah, and if you have a look, I mean, you've only got to look at the top surface of this camera. If you're not watching the video, if you're listening to us on the podcast, I'll describe it to you. It's got a great big mode dial on the top. It's got program aperture, shutter priority, full manual, and you can control this camera and indeed any of its rivals fully manually if you want. You can set the aperture, you can set the shutter, you can set the ISO. So if you want complete control and the focus as well, complete control over it, then you can do that. The, the thing that makes these cameras special is that they are just about 
thin and light enough for you to put in a larger pocket. It's, it's going to bulge a bit in the shirt pocket, but it is going to fit in your trousers. It's easily going to fit in almost any kind of bag you could mention. So it is it is just about a pocket camera. So it's giving you a lot more quality, but still remaining portable. That is the key message of these cameras. And then kind of beyond that, what you're doing is comparing the individual feature set, the lens range, the focal ratio, the video quality, and even within the manual controls, exactly how they implement them. And that's what we're, we're going to talk about here because they all do it slightly differently. And as we'll talk about them, you'll go, oh, I'm not sure about that, but oh yeah, that's what I want. That's, that's what makes them different. I mean, to get it out of the way right now, this camera is it's kind of headline features are that it has a three times optical zoom, which is kind of par for the course for this sort of size. That bigger sensor means that if you want a bigger lens, you, a longer lens, you're going to need a physically bigger lens. So in order to retain that pocketable form factor, you're never going to get a massive zoom ratio on it. Being a Panasonic camera, it also supports 4K video and all of their clever 4K photo modes we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the probably the major thing to get out of the way right now is that the composition on this camera is with the screen alone. This does not have a built in viewfinder. And that, I think, is probably the first decision you have to make when you're buying one of these cameras. Do you want a built in viewfinder or not? Now, Doug, you've been using the Sony RX100 series since they introduced the viewfinder with the Mark III. I wanted to ask you because I've got some specific feelings about this, but I wanted to ask you. How important is a viewfinder on a camera like this? Well, if you go back over the last year or year, two years and listen to our reviews on these, I was always talking about how important the viewfinder was for me because they were bifocals and I didn't want to have to go like this, tilt my head up and look through the lower half of my bifocals to see the LCD. But, you know, I've had three of these Sony compacts now, um, Two of them, at least, with viewfinders. I don't know. Did the, did the Model 2, the Sony R Mark no. II have it? No. All right. So no. the 3 and the 4 have had the viewfinder. But you know what, Gordon? I use it less and less. What's really important to me is having that tilting screen. That's critical. Um, yeah. And so I would say my personal experience is the viewfinder is not critical. Um, the tilting screen I find much more valuable. The interesting thing for me is that when I shoot with the RX 103 or 4 or indeed the latest 5, I pop the viewfinder out all the time and I use it all the time and I'm thinking, wow, I love this viewfinder. How could I possibly live without it? But yet when I pick up the uh, the LX10, LX15 here, or Canon's PowerShot G7X and Mark II, which we'll also talk about, I never, I never really miss the viewfinder. Occasionally when the sun is very bright and it's shining on the screen and it's making it hard to see, then I'll think, oh, I wish this thing had a viewfinder. But almost always it's not an issue so it's one of those things where if you have it you use it and you love it and if you don't have it you kind of it's, it's okay but i know for some people it will be a deal breaker so that's the first thing to get out of the way the lx10 15 does not have a built-in viewfinder it's composition with the screen alone so let's talk about the uh, oh actually before we move on it's not just a simple thing of whether you want a viewfinder or not. You're going to be paying more for a model with a viewfinder. Doug, do you happen to have a price for an RX100 Mark III? Yeah, the Mark III from the so Sony now costs in the U.S. $748. So it's already, you know, $50 more than this one. But the Mark IV, which I own at the moment, is almost $900. And let's not even talk about the Mark V. It's $1,000. Yeah, so the, uh, and the things that the Mark IV and the Mark V add are, are incredible slow motion video and uh, 4K, although this camera also has 4K. So Sony has really kind of upped the price of that. So when you look at these cameras, a lot of people will go, you know, this LX10 is quite expensive. I'll say, well, <laughs> have a look at the Sony RX100, the latest ones of those. So really, this camera's closest competitor is the Canon PowerShot G7X Mark II. I said I was going to talk about the screen, but before I do that, I want to look at the actual physical design of this camera. And it's a pretty smart looking uh, camera, quite clean lines and clean design. You'll notice on the front, it's got quite a, a mild grip. There's a bulge that runs up the entire front surface of the camera, but it's quite smooth. It's quite smooth and shiny. So that while there is a bulge that you can hold as a, as a grip, your fingers can slip a little bit. In this respect, it's better than the Sony RX100 series, which is not only smooth on the front, but has no grip at all. It's completely smooth on the front. But I think all of these fall behind Canon's PowerShot G7X Mark II, which over the Mark I added this quite chunky grip, more importantly with a rubber textured coating on it, 
that just feels really, really comfortable and uh, and nice in your hands. Interestingly, another model we're going to be talking about is the older Lubix LX100, which style-wise is actually quite similar to the G7X Mark II. It too has a chunky grip with a rubber coating. And these cameras, they, they do feel nicer. So so for me, in terms of the, the, the grip on the LX10-15, it's kind of in the middle of that group. But again, it's a very personal thing. I, you know, I always recommend that people you know, go into shops if they can and pick them up and try them in person. One of the other things I'd like to note, uh, to note is that on the top, you'll see that there's a power switch next to the mode dial. It is not a power button. It is a power switch. And that is important because... I'll tell you why. <laughs> I'm glad you. I pitched that, and it just. <laughs> and it went. I don't know what you're going to say. <laughs> well, the reason this is important is that on some compact cameras, which have got power buttons, you can power straight into playback from the camera being switched mm. off by pushing and holding the play button. You can do this on the Sony RX100 series. You can do it on the Canon G7X series. You can't, however, do it on the Panasonic cameras, which have got a power switch because the camera has got to be switched on first. Um, now, there is a slight workaround where you can hold the power button down while you switch it on. That does work, although there is a bit of a delay when it happens. But it's not, a, you know, a little two-fingered operation. It's not as convenient. Now, I, I, I love the, I'm not, I was going to use the word visceral. It's not exactly visceral, is it? A power switch flicking on and off. But I do like the physicality of a switch but in terms of usability i think a power button and a play button uh, would work better for me i mean doug how many times have you powered your rx100 straight into playback by pushing and holding the play button is this something you would you do oh, oh no all the time i in fact i discovered it first on my rico gr mark ii and then you pointed out that the Sony had it, and I didn't know it, and I went back and used the Sony. I do it a lot because it's a minor annoyance, but when I just want to look at images, I don't want to wait for that lens to extend. And it actually takes, you know, what is it, uh, a second, second and a half or so, but it's an annoying delay. And then you say, oh my God, I'm using battery, you know. So it's nice yeah. to be able to just push the play button, you get into the playback mode immediately. Uh, and I find it a really nice little feature, so I agree with you. Looking at the design again, if I hold the camera up so you can have a look at it, you'll see that there's uh, aperture numbers around the lens there. Now, almost all of these premium compacts, in fact, all of them that I can think of, have control rings around the lens barrel. And some of them click, some of them are smooth, but almost all of them can be configured to adjust various things like the ISO or the focal length or all the, the focal ratio, all manner of things. Now the LX10, LX15 has not one, but two dials around the lens barrel. It has a smooth, freely spinning one on the front, which again, you can configure to do whatever you want. It's quite handy, for example, you could set it to adjust the ISO and you could adjust it manually while you're filming and it's nice and silent because it doesn't click. But yet on the inner side, it has a dedicated ring for controlling the aperture, the focal ratio of this lens. This one does click rather satisfyingly in third EV increments. And it's got two little handles on either side, which make it easier to turn, because if it didn't, it'd be quite hard to turn one and not the other. So two rings make this quite unique. A lot of other cameras, say if you had the Sony, you'd be going, oh, I've only got a smooth ring, which feels great for movie use, but not tactile enough for, say, adjusting the aperture. Uh, Canon's got a nice solution on the G7X Mark II because its ring is smooth until you flick a switch and then it clicks and then you flick a switch and then it's smooth again. But these cameras only have one ring each. The LX10 or LX15 has got two. And that's one of the quite classy things. And it leads me neatly on to the focal ratio of this lens because if I hold it up again, you'll see maybe that this lens opens up to f1.4 which is pretty unique in the compact camera market. In fact, I think it's about the only one that has a zoom that opens to f1.4. So without further ado, let's talk about lenses. The LX10, LX15 is equipped with a three times optical zoom. It's equivalent to 24 to 72 millimeter, but the focal ratio is quite bright. It starts at f1.4 and it reaches f2.8 at the long end of the scale. To put this in some sort of perspective, the Sony RX100 3, 4 and 5 all share the same lens. It's a 24 to 70. You're not going to notice any difference with those two millimeters. Don't worry about that. Their start size slightly slower optically, f1.8, but again, closes to f2.8 at the end. The Canon G7X Mark 1 and 2 is the one that's a bit different here. 
It also starts at 24 mil, but it goes all the way to 100 mil. So it zooms quite a bit longer. And again, it's 1.8 when it's uh, wide and it's 2.8 when it's at the long end. Now, one of the more interesting, well, let's just look at those focal ratios for a minute. F1.4 is two thirds of a stop brighter than F1.8. So in terms of exposure, it's going to allow you under the same lighting conditions to use, say, a sensitivity, two thirds of a stop slower for better quality. Or it would allow you at the same sensitivity and aperture, a shutter speed, that's two thirds of a stop faster, easier for freezing action. And, you know, if you look at, I, I always publish ISO results, you know, look at this camera at 400 ISO and then at 800. And normally at a certain point, there's quite a big difference in a stop of ISO, usually between say 1600 and 3200 ISO, there's quite a big drop in quality on this class of camera. So it's not a full stop advantage, but it's almost, it's two thirds of a, of a stop, uh, f1.4 over uh, f1.8. It's important to note that you only get this advantage when the lenses are fully zoomed out to their widest 24 mil. Literally the instant, and this isn't a fault of the Panasonic, they all do this, the instant you start to zoom in, even one millimeter, that lens aperture begins to close. And this one becomes uh, closest to f1.8 by the time it's at like 25 and a half millimeter. So it's the, there is only an advantage at 24. Beyond 25 and a half millimeter, approximately, there is no advantage in, in focal ratio on this. But if you are shooting at 24, that is nice. Whether you're filming video or you're shooting stills, it's nice to be able to shoot at, say, lower ISOs. But for me, the thing that makes this lens more interesting than its rivals is its closest focusing distance, which is three centimeters when you are at 24 mil whereas the Sony and the Canon are five centimeters. Now, it doesn't sound like a great deal of difference, just two centimeters, but the difference between three and five, it's almost twice the difference. It lets you get almost twice as close with this camera. And in terms of macro close-up facilities, I mean, you can focus, you can reproduce a subject so much larger on the LX10, LX15 than you can with its rivals. And coupled with that brighter focal ratio, you can really throw that background more out of focus. So if you're into shooting macro stuff, and I'm talking real close-up stuff, then this Panasonic has an edge over its competition. But equally at the, or conversely, I should say, at the other end of the scale, I shot uh, portraits with these cameras, fully zoomed in, and obviously with the, against the Canon, and obviously with the Canon, I could step back further because I was at 100 mil compared to 72. And that longer focal length on the Canon gave you flatter perspective. And because they were both f2.8 at that end, the Canon was more, the background was more blurred. It was more isolated. So if you were generally shooting at the longer end of the range, portraits, and you wanted a blurred background, I'd probably go for the Canon. If you're into shooting macro and close-ups, um, and you you can exploit shooting at 24 millimeter a lot, then the Lumix has the advantage. So again, they're all similar, but they're these little differences. So I've got one question to ask you, Gordon. It's sort of a a niggly little thing for me. This camera has what we call a PASM dial. That's the mode dial that says program A for P, aperture priority A, shutter priority S, or manual M. But it also has an aperture ring that actually has F stops on it. So what happens if you put the camera in S for shutter priority, in which case you're telling the camera to pick the sh to pick the aperture, but yet you've also dialed in, you know, f4 on that ring. What happens? Nothing. Isn't there a co isn't there a conflict? No, no, it doesn't do it. It ignores it. I'm doing it right now. It does nothing. You could look at the camera, and the lens will be set. You think it's set to f4, but in fact, it's not. Yes, that is true. That is true. That is that is a downside to it. And as far as I understand, hopefully someone might prove me wrong you can't reconfigure it to do something else. So it's only actually of any use, say, in manual or aperture priority. Yeah, now, so you've got these things. You've been on everybody's case for touch screens, for USB charging, which, by the way, I believe this camera does support. It and does. I'm on a campaign to get rid of the PASM dial. I want controls like Fuji. I want... Shutter speed dials, I want aperture dials, I want ISO and exposure compensation dials or something close to it. Anyway, I'll, I'll get off my uh, soapbox here. Um, <laughs> let's talk about let's talk about the screen though because we talked oh no just before we just before we leave the lens, 
so there were lots of differences. You know, look at that closest focusing distance. Also, look at that. It's a bit of a shame. For some reason, Panasonic do not build neutral density filters into these types of cameras. They didn't put one in the LX100, and they didn't put one in the LX10, LX15 here. The Canon and Sony both do that, and they are really useful when you're filming video because you can block out, you know, a lot of a lot of bright daylight and, and film at nice, video-friendly, slow shutter speeds. With this, it's a bit more of a challenge because it doesn't have that built-in ND filter. So that's another thing you have to weigh up when you're comparing all of these specs. But I wanted to kind of go round to the back of the camera and show you the screen. Now, it's a, it's a, a tilting screen, and it tilts up. It keeps going up, 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 up until it reaches 180 degrees and it faces the subject. So you can film pieces to camera, you can take selfies. That's fantastic. I'm really glad that it has that functionality. But here's the weird thing. When you tilt it back down again, there is no facility for it to angle the other way. You cannot tilt this screen down, which means when you want to shoot high over the heads of crowds or over a fence or something like that, you cannot do that with the LX10. Uh, interestingly, this was a, a limitation of the original Canon G7X, but on the Mark II they fixed that. But it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a strange thing that Panasonic didn't put it on the LX10, LX15. It only tilts one way. And in fact, I was only taking a picture of this camera this weekend, and there was there were these railings uh, in front of this amazing big landscape view. I was in Spain, and I couldn't. Well, I could hold the camera up, but I, I couldn't see as easily. And I thought, oh, that's so annoying. You can't you can't angle that back down again. You could, of course, hold the camera upside down and angle it out and take the picture, but holding that over a fence with a sheer drop on the other side, I wasn't that confident about doing that. So that's a bit of an odd limitation, but I am pleased to say that it does have a touch sensitive screen and Panasonic makes great use of this, not just for tapping your way through the, uh, the interface and the settings, but also in its 4K photo modes that we can, we can move on to if you would like to do yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I want to hear about that. So it, of course, shoots video. It will shoot 1080p video, but at quite high frame rates. It will shoot 1080p video up to 120p. So if you're putting that in a 30p timeline, you can slow it down by four times. Is my math correct? Yes, it is. Yep. Uh, it will also film 4K because Panas it's a Panasonic, and Panasonic are very pro 4K, so it will do that up to 30p. And again, you've got to look at the price point of this camera because it's roughly similar to a Canon PowerShot G7X Mark II, which doesn't have 4K, and in fact only has 1080 up to, I think, 60p. So it beats it on both counts. I mean, Sony beats it even more so with the Mark IV and Mark V RX100, but as we already discussed at the beginning of the show, they are significantly more expensive cameras. So the LX10, LX15 is coming in at a really nice price point considering it does have 4K video and high frame rate 1080p. Now, when you are filming 4K on, the, on this camera, there is a bit of a crop because that sensor has got 20 megapixels, so it's taking quite a crop. It's not a one-to-one -one crop, but it is quite tight nonetheless, and it changes the effective field of view. Remember, this is a 24 to 72 lens. It's not when you're filming 4K. When you're filming 4K, it becomes a 36 to 108 lens. So you lose a lot at the wide end. You gain a bit at the telephoto end. So if you're trying to get close to something, that's great news. If you're trying to film a nice sweeping vista, in 4K, though, you'll think, oh, no, what happened to my 24 mil wide angle? Well, it's gone. It becomes 36. And that's also important because that has an impact on the 4K photo modes, which I'm going to talk about right now. All of those 4K photo modes effectively now have a widest angle of 36 mil equivalent. So you don't get the 4K photo modes at 24. It starts at 36. That said, here's what you can do. Now, Panasonic realized a long time ago that 4K is filming effectively 8 megapixel images 30 times per second. So why not extract them as stills? Why not use it for still photography? You know, we're always talking about burst modes. It shoots at 5 frames per second, 10 frames per second, 15. Well, this is shooting at 30 frames per second with 8 megapixel images effectively. That's, that's what 4K video lets you do. There's nothing to stop you extracting stills from 4K video from any camera, but Panasonic makes it dead easy. They've got a really nice user interface. So the first thing you can do with this, I'm going to start uh, start another thing going while I'm talking. I'm trying to multitask, but I think I've proven that I can't do that. <laughs> I'm not feeling 100%. So the 4K photo mode lets you kind of shoot a burst of video and then extract stills from it afterwards and like i say it's got a very nice user interface to, to scroll through those pictures it's great for getting the decisive moment not just for action 
but also for portraits even. I, I've, I've taken a lot of portraits in the 4K photo mode and you'll see people blinking and their eyes opening. And it, it's amazing how just moving one frame, a 30th of a second back and forth either way, you will find one frame that looks a lot better than the other ones. And it's really nice to get that moment just right. I use it a lot, say at birthday parties, the kids' birthday parties, and, and when you're doing like a, the happy birthday song comes along. Well, there's always a dilemma, isn't there? Do I film video or do I take stills? Well, you can do both. And the kid's only looking into one camera. There's not, look into my camera. No, look into my camera. They're looking into one camera lens uh, for stills and for video. So you film video and then you extract eight megapixel stills from it afterwards. It works well. You can go back and forth just to that right moment when they're, you know, they're blowing the candles out. The candle flame looks really nice. It really works. But Panasonic has gone several steps forward from that. So it's thought to itself, wait a minute. We can capture 4K video, 30 frames per second, eight megapixel images can be extracted from that 30 times a second. How else could we use that? And in one of the cleverest applications for 4K photo, it came up with this idea called post focus. So now what it does is it's not actually taking a picture, it's filming video, but while it's filming the video, it racks the focus. So it focuses from the closest thing in the composition to the furthest thing in the composition. It does this pretty quickly typically about two seconds to capture that. So you'll take a photo, except it's actually a video. It racks the focus. And the reason it does this is because it can then let you choose the point of focus after the event. So here's a picture or a video that I took earlier in my favorite cafe in Brighton. And you can see, if you're hopefully watching the video, you can see a jar of sugar in the foreground, and you can see that the background's blurred. Now, it's quite hard for me to do this with the camera face away from me, but I've shown you before, and I'll describe what's happening. If I tap the background, you will see that the focus has moved to the background. If I tap the foreground, the uh, jar of sugar, hopefully that should move focus there. It's now zoomed in on that, which isn't what I wanted to happen. Let me assure you that it works. I'm just going to tap it and then show you it. There's the jar of sugar focused, and then if I tap the background and show you again, you can see that the background is now in focus. And at any point here, you can then push the button in the middle, the OK button, to extract an 8 megapixel still. It works really, 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 really well. And it looks really spooky because you'll be, you look at this thing, this is amazing. I'm actually refocusing the shot after the event. But it's not any kind of clever light field technology or some science fiction camera that's going on here. All that's happening, because you conveniently forget this when you play it back, you conveniently forget that the camera actually captured, took about two seconds to capture a burst of video during which time it managed to focus the lens from near to far. And basically in that video file, it's got everything in focus. All you need to do is tell it which frame you want. But this is the really clever thing because Panasonic's playback interface, I mean, it's basically just a video player, but it does it very cleverly because while it's recording the video, it remembers where the subject was that was in focus. So it's not like saying, oh, just rewind to the closest thing. It remembers that the closest thing was in the bottom left corner of the screen. So that when I tap the bottom left corner of the screen, it knows exactly what frame to fast forward or rewind to. And it presents it on the screen. And that's the really important thing, because when you're in your pub, when you're in the pub showing your mates this, you go, look at this. This is brilliant. I'm just tapping the screen and it's refocusing on, on what I want. And that post focus has been introduced with some firmware updates on some older cameras. I mean, it does need a touch screen. And unfortunately, this is something that they've not equipped the earlier LX100 with. It could do 4K video, it could do 4K photo, but they've not been able to implement this post focus on it um, with a firmware update because it didn't have a touch screen. But now this model does, so it lets you do it. But Panasonic's taken it even further still. It says, wait a minute, if we've just captured, say, 30 or 60 frames with everything in focus, you know, in little steps, we could actually focus stack selected regions. What that means is it's actually getting more than one image and it sticks them on top of each other and it just pays attention to the parts that are in focus. This is great for macro photography because your depth of field is very, very, very shallow. So what you could do again in that example is you could tap, you could say, you know what, I want everything from that jar of sugar, but only to the end of the table. Not any further. I don't want the background in focus. I just want the jar of sugar to the end of the table. You tap those two things. And then it goes away for a few seconds, the camera, and it stacks all the images it needs that are in focus between those two distances and creates a new JPEG where everything is, is focus stacked and, and sharp within those two distance ranges. I mean, it's very, very clever. All it is really is recording 4K video and refocusing the lens, but it's presenting it with such a clever media player 
you know, disguised as just, you know, a simple playback. That it just it just works really really well. And for me, this is one of the major advantages of uh, Panasonic's 4K cameras over the rest of the competition. I mean, you can film 4K with loads of cameras these days, and there is nothing at all stopping you from taking that file into your computer and just grabbing frames from it. Some other cameras, like Canon, for example, in playback, now lets you grab still photos from 4K video, but none of them, as far as I know, none of them are letting you do this clever refocusing trick. You know, it's, it's very clever to, to do that. So one question I have about that, because uh, I remember testing one of the Lumix cameras when the first they first come out with the idea of doing 4k video for the purpose of stills and that has to do with shutter speed when you're shooting video you normally use quite a slow shutter speed in order to make it look more cinematic but when you shoot a still image you might want to use quite a bit faster at 125th at 250th or something like that do you know what this camera does when you're shooting 4k four stills does it use higher shutter speeds does it does it honor the shutter speed you've selected Yes, that's a very interesting question. And if you've got it in one of the 4K photo modes, it will. It, it is basically assuming that your priority is a still image, not for video. So in those instances, it will use a more still photo friendly, faster shutter speed. Conversely, if you're shooting video as your primary function and you just so happen to want to extract some stills from it afterwards, then you've got to run the risk that maybe your shutter speed is going to be quite slow and that there may be some motion blur in it. So it, it doesn't, you know, it's the best of both worlds, really, or the worst of both, depending on the way you look at it. When you're filming video, the priority is video and it uses video friendly shutter speeds. If, the, if you're using 4K photo, the priority is still photography. So it's going to be using photo friendly shutter speeds. But in both instances, you can still get access to that video file if you want it, which is nice because you may, you know, your, your goal may have been to get a still photo, but you may have ended up capturing two seconds of really nice video during that process. Mm -hmm. Well, that video file is still there and you can use it. Like I say, the only restriction on the LX10, LX15 is because of the quite severe crop that it uses for 4K video, you miss out on, on the really wide angle coverage instead of 24 it's 36 equivalent. And it's interesting to mention the LX100 again because it employed a different crop factor for 4K where its 24 mil actually was only reduced to 26 mil. So hardly any difference at all. So the LX100 is actually, if you're into wide angle 4K photography, could be a better bet. And I think that probably leads us on to a kind of conclusion and, and working out which how these cameras compare, which one you should go for. Yeah, yeah. Again, let's take a look at um, what the lineup here. We've got this, the LX10-15. We've got the LX100. We've talked about that. The Canon G7X Mark II. And then the whole Sony RX100 line. You know, I've got my RX100 Mark IV right here. Uh, you know, I keep buying these upgrades and then Sony comes out with a new one right away. So I don't have the Mark V. I probably won't get it. Um you know, my take is that Panasonic really, as always, Lumix really shines on the video. And if video is important to you, that that may be your best choice. What would you say, Gordon? Yeah, so I mean, the things, the Sony RX100 Mark 3, 4, and 5, the, the biggest advantage is the built-in viewfinder. On the Mark 4 and the Mark 5, the advantages that you've got are uh, the slow motion video it does these ridiculously high frame rate modes you know 240 480 even 960 frames per second it's pretty specialist stuff though i mean when i test cameras it's really nice to film something in 960 frames per second and go wow look at that incredible slow motion filmmakers love it but i don't know how many people would actually use that so it's become quite a specialist feature um they also have the built-in nd filters but really their, their primary advantage over the LX10, LX15 is that built-in viewfinder in the case of the Mark IV, the Mark V, the uh, the really, really fast video and also faster burst shooting. The Mark V also adds face detect autofocus. I mean, it's they're, they're very sophisticated cameras, but you're paying quite a lot for them. I think really the major competition for the LX10, LX15 is the Canon G7X Mark II and Panasonic's own LX100. I mean, just to briefly go over some of the differences, the LX100 is quite an interesting camera. So it's 24 to 75 mil lens, similar focal length. F1.7 to 2.8 is not quite as bright, but again, similar. Where they really differed, it has a built-in viewfinder. Now, it's one that Panasonic used in some earlier cameras. That's 16 by 9 in shape. So great for video, 
less good for stills. It's a field sequential technology, which I personally don't get on. It makes my eyes water. For some people, they, they think it's great, but for me, I prefer the OLEDs and the, the LCDs. So I wasn't a big fan of the viewfinder, but it does have a viewfinder. Um, the really big difference is it's got a different sensor. It's not a one-inch sensor. It's actually one of their four-thirds, micro four-thirds sensors. It's a bigger sensor. It's actually a 16 megapixel sensor, but because the optics, it can't use all 16 megapixels of it. It can only use 12 megapixels of it. But because that means it's now got a border that's not doing anything around the edge of that sensor, rather than just ignoring it, Panasonic's engineers cleverly went, well, you know what? Let's actually allow this camera to be able to capture different aspect ratios like 16 by 9 or 3 by 2 or 4 by 3 and maintain that resolution, maintain that 12 megapixel resolution and the field of view. Normally, when you change aspect ratio, you crop. It simply crops it, either from the sides or the top and the bottom. Your field of view becomes smaller. You're losing pixels. You're losing detail. But this way, uh, you maintain the resolution and the field of view just about. It doesn't have a touch screen. It doesn't even have a tilting screen. Urgh! It doesn't have USB charging. Urgh! There is no perfect model, but it is quite cheap. I think when I checked the prices just before uh, we did this call, I mean, it's actually a little bit cheaper, isn't it? The LX100 is two years old. Uh, no, the, the, the LX100 is $100 more than the LX10 slash 15. Ah, in the US maybe, but in the UK, it's actually a little bit cheaper. I think you're right, Doug, actually. I think you're right that in the US, it's a little bit more expensive. Mm -hmm. But in the UK, it's actually a little bit cheaper. But it's roughly in the same ballpark. And there's mm -hmm. pros and cons in both. You know, it's got a viewfinder. It does have 4K video. It does have, you know, this multi-aspect ratio. It does 4K with a much milder crop. But it doesn't have a touch screen, it doesn't have a tilting screen, it doesn't have USB charging, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't support the latest 4K photo features because it doesn't have the touch screen. So those are some of the differences. The G7X Mark II from Canon looks on paper like it's going to be thrashed by the, uh, the LX10, LX15 because they're roughly the same price. But it doesn't do 4K video. It doesn't even do high frame rate 1080p. It's um, not as bright or, or focused as close as the wide end. But, you know, some things do work in its favor. I found like it was better for portraits so at 100 mil. That extra 30 millimeter really does make the difference at the portrait end. It's got that built-in ND filter and it's got a much nicer grip as well. And it's got a screen that angles down a bit. Why didn't Panasonic have a screen that angled down a bit? Very odd. So these are all these little features that you have to think about and weigh up. But ultimately, for me, these cameras do all deliver genuinely better quality than a smartphone, much nicer colors, much better tonal dynamic range. Mm -hmm. And thanks to their built-in Wi-Fi, you know, it's very easy to transfer pictures on and to share from them. And I, I use them a lot, you know, as a, as a kind of travel camera, as a backup camera to, compared to, you know, like my main interchangeable lens body. They're really, they're really nice. I'm happy to see more of them out there. You know, you could complain that this doesn't have a viewfinder, but it hits a lower price point. Well, it sounds to, to sort of distill what I've been hearing from you, like the LX10 slash 15 is really a winner in this category. The only reason you might want to switch to the Sony, which is $200 more expensive, at least the, um, the uh, Mark IV. The only reason you would probably do that is if you really wanted that pop-up viewfinder or if for some reason you were particularly enamored with those awful Sony menus. That would be the only reason that you might want to do that. But. And the slow motion video and the really ridiculously high frame rate video. You know, yeah. that that's the thing that makes the Mark IV and the Mark V totally unique in the market is that they can film at 960 frames per second. But who's going to use it? And you're, get, and you're getting quite a small image at those frame rates. Yes. And the higher the frame rate goes, the worse the quality gets. I mean, if you want 1080p quality or thereabouts, you're really looking at up to 240 frames per second. Beyond there, the quality drops a lot. But at 240 frames per second, it does look really, really nice. Now, it's slowing it down twice as much as it is at 120. But then this does 120. You know, it's, it's enough for... What's nice at 120 frames per second is if you've got a dog running towards you on a beach... You can slow it down. It does look pretty cool. Birds taking off, you know, a group of pigeons. Or, you know, it's a slow enough frame rate. Slowing it down by like four times is just enough to make people look really cool in a kind of reservoir dogs type way. You get your friends to walk towards you in a purposeful manner. Slow it down by four times. They're going to look four times cooler and they'll thank you for it. So that's a nice feature. <laughs> so it's the, it's the friend enhancement mode that these cameras offer. 
Exactly. Why I didn't start with that, I don't know. Ah, there you go. Well, Gordon, you've, we, we've done a really nice overview, not just of the LX10 slash 15, but also this entire category. As you said at the very beginning of the show, this is a category of cameras that is still surviving, quite valuable because, as you say, it's a step up from the point and shoot, certainly, and a step up from most uh, smartphone cameras. Um, I love having mine. As I said, it's the number two camera I often take with me as my 2470 in the pocket. Gordon, great review. Um, I want to thank you and thank everyone for listening or watching and remind you that if you're interested in purchasing an LX10 or an LX15 or any of the other cameras we mentioned here on Camera Labs, or for that matter, anything at all, please go to CameraLabs.com, click on the Buy Now links, head over to your, fam for your favorite retailer. And, you know, even if you're going to buy uh, underwear or toilet paper, if you get there through our links, it's going to help Gordon buy coffee. So let's do that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's the great thing about the, the, you know, buying stuff through the affiliate links. It doesn't matter what you buy, when you buy it, it does support us. So uh, please go ahead and do that. And again, if you want to go shooting with Doug on a personal photo workshop, head over to DougK.com and find out when his next workshop is taking place. Doug, I want to go to Cuba with you because it looks like great fun and I could think of no better guide. Yeah, well, we'll we're going to have a lot of fun. I'm heading there three times in the next year. So uh, yes, please check that out. Gordon, thanks once again, and we'll see you everyone again on Camera Labs. Bye-bye.